There is something serious about this podcast I did the other day. Uh, if you've not sat down and, and seriously looked at my content in a little while, or if you're somebody super deep into my content, an incredible job here in this podcast, going in a little bit of a different direction about me and my mindset. I have a funny feeling when I read the comments uh, that this will be really, uh, really talked about and really analyzed. I hope you enjoy it. I'm very excited about it. Uh, sit down, grab a cup of eggnog, and enjoy. A lot of people try to day trade attention through social media and making a business of it. So what can be better than to talk to an expert on the subject? Welcome to this podcast, Gary Vaynerchuk. How are you? I'm amazing. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. Thank Good. You. Thanks for having me. Listen, how does one become an expert on a thing that is still growing and people still try to figure it out? I mean, social media. By being a practitioner. You know, there was a day when painting was new and the people that became good at it were the ones that were painting. It's amazing to me how many people have opinions about Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn or making videos or doing this kind of podcast and getting people to listen to it. A whole lot of people with opinions who've never done it. And so I believe the great way to be great at anything is to be a practitioner. Um, you know, it's kind of, people ask me all the time, I, I make the analogy, you know, you can read about push-ups, but if you want the results that push-ups give you, you have to do the push-ups. And uh, I just think a lot of people with business, entrepreneurship, and specifically being a, a social media content creator uh, or a modern media digital creator, uh, read a lot, talk a lot, pontificate a lot, and don't do a lot. The way I figured out how to have my podcast, the way I figured out my YouTube show, the way I figured out everything I do is by doing. Um, and you're gonna get some bumps and you're gonna make some mistakes. I think most people don't do because they're worried about what other people think. And who are they? What kind of generation are we talking about? Everybody. You know, I think everybody. I think, I don't think this is as generational as people think. I think this is more psychology than it is, you know, none of the four people sitting in this room, right? Well, Babin's young, but the three of them, you're pretty, how old are you? 35. Yeah. I'll, I'll, Get 30. talking to our sound engineer. That's now. right. I bring everybody into these podcasts. I like to break the walls and visualize for you, everybody who's listening. Yeah. Look, the three of us didn't, like, 35, I would say, look, you know, it's not about how old you, I'm 42 and I feel more curious and more understanding of the culture and the game than plenty of people that are 18. I think it's a mindset. Um, and so it's a very interesting time to be alive. There's so much opportunity and uh, I'm excited to be a part of it. But you are a very, how do you say? Uh, special. You're, yeah, yes, you're very special. <laughs> no, because the thing is that you have this psychological uh, uh, skill that a lot of people come to you with a lot of problems. And they try to get advices from you and you just give them advices. How, what kind of skill is that? <laughs> that's psychiatrist, that's, you know, psychologist, that's right. You know, if I, was a, if I was the son of me, instead of me, I would have probably went to a top five university and been a big time psychiatrist or psychologist, like 100%, because I was born an immigrant in a different environment and probably had a little bit too much, you know, competitive entrepreneurial DNA. But yeah, I, I think it's interesting as my life evolves that some of my natural skills are becoming more clear and it's less about being a salesman or being good at digital marketing. I'm very comfortable giving advice because I think I'm undereducated and I keep things very simple. Like human behavior comes very natural to me which is why I've been very good at predicting what people are gonna do next. It's also the same skill that allows me to know that most of people's issues come from their parents or the environment they were born in. Um, most things are very simple. We don't wanna look them in the face. You know, Facebook's not changing us. Facebook's not making us bad people. Facebook's exposing that we were bad to begin with. You know, like these are funny things to me. They're historical. I'm a big fan of history. It was the one class I was actually decent at. And I think that's another thing that's worked well for me. This is just rinse and repeat. You know, what's happening right now on Facebook and Twitter is the same reason that governments, when they wanna be dictatorships, control the media. 
because the media controls the mindset. And so, you know, I, uh, I think my skill is uh, human behavior and I think uh, my vice or my intrigue on another part of my life is building businesses and, and I think that's what, made, you know, I bought Bitcoin in 2014, not because I guessed, not because of anything else, but because I could see what was gonna happen in 17 and 18 and yeah, I think, uh, you know, I make the joke earlier about special, but I do feel special and I don't say that with ego. I say that as a compliment to my parents and to my circumstance and to America and to the Soviet Union for that matter. The circumstances of who I became um, are far more the factor than me. Um, But I, I do see around corners and not because I'm Nostradamus, but because I deeply am consumer centric. I watch what people wear. When haircuts change, I'm fascinated by that. You know, when fashion, I'd be, I would have been great in fashion. I would have been, if I had that gene, like my daughter's very creative and I can see she has a lot of me in her. I can see her being a big time fashion uh, player in the future because if she deploys her creativity to fashion and she can see around corners, she'll be an innovator of style and so, yeah, I, things are very simple to me. But social me- media and uh, the the human brain goes hand in hand. I mean, the human psychology. And human brain goes hand in hand with everything. Uh, social media is very important because it's communication. You and I, right now, are sitting in some room at some conference. Uh, this amazingly handsome, talented sound engineer has a very small device. Doesn't look so complicated to me. I wouldn't know what to do with it, but it's not big. Here's, and I know that this whole enterprise here is not costing a whole lot to create and not costing a whole lot to distribute if you guys know what you're doing on I. It doesn't cost me a lot to distribute on my podcast, which is a top 50 podcast in the world. That whole enterprise used to cost millions of dollars in studio costs, in distribution co- It's We're living in the internet age. Why don't people get this more and faster? I mean... Because people look backwards instead of looking forward. 90% of people default into looking behind them instead of looking ahead of them. It's the human psyche. I think most people are scared of change and they look for negatives. There's people that are trying to blame suicide rates on social media, it's laughable. The issue with suicide rates in the world is bad parenting and, and many other variables and maybe social media. But to binarily blame uh, a media is silly and so I think when I look at what happens, so I think there's a lot of technology fear mongering. Uh, one thing I like to say a lot is that we put writing a letter on a pedestal, but kids that are texting are bad. I think that's crazy. The message is important, not the thing that delivers it. You uh, invested, as you said before, uh, you knew about Facebook before Facebook Facebook was uh, big, and invested in Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, Uber, and you are a rich son of a gun. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But how can you inspire your kids? I mean, you had a total different. I can't. Of- I can't inspire them the way that I was inspired. You know, when because I was. Because they have too much. A hundred percent. And they have other things. They have a father who's going to end up being famous, and that might be good or bad. First, the way I'm going to inspire my kids is to first do what I always do, which is audit who they are, not who I hope they are. I first have to deploy self-awareness and empathy. And, and understand who they are. So for my daughter who's eight, I'm starting to get an understanding and in three or four or five years, I think I'm gonna have a very good understanding. I'm gonna inspire my two children and what I try to inspire everybody who's listening to this is I don't want them to become me. I only want one thing for people that I have. Really, outside of health, the only thing I wish for people is them to love what they do as much as I do. When I do new podcasts or new video shows, I love reading the comments of the audience that don't know me. Inevitably, 5% of the audience will leave a comment that refers to drugs. Uh, If they wanna be really snarky, they'll say I, you know, cocaine, Ritalin, you know. um, They they think that um, I'm on something and I always reply because 
I've never tried smoking a cigarette, let alone done Adderall. Uh, I reply with grat, the ant- so they'll say cocaine, and I'll reply gratitude. I'm so grateful that I do what I love every day, and what I love for clarification is just being an entrepreneur, playing. The challenges, the risk, the excitement. But you're also high on your own energy. You have tremendous energy. I have tremendous energy because it it builds momentum. When you're doing what you want to be doing for a long period of time, it builds momentum. I didn't have the same energy in school. I hated school. I was optimistic, I was high energy, that's my DNA, but not like this. This is now a supernova because now I'm 20 years into being in my zone. The, the breath of fresh air, the exhale I had on the first day that I worked at my dad's liquor store, like worked, like there was no more school ever again. That was incredible. That is a, I, I will never replicate that feeling again. I miss that feeling, it's funny, I've never talked about this out loud. That might have been the best day of my life in a lot of ways, knowing that I was embarking on the thing that I was meant to do. So if my children want to give away all my money, want to paint in the Himalayas, want to start a school, want to, or want to climb the mountain and be bigger than me, I just want to inspire them to be themselves and support them mentally. But shouldn't you, that didn't like the school system at all, shouldn't you be the one to start a school? Mm-hmm. I sure should. And? And I will. Call me. You got it. Um, and by the way, I think I am. And, this is, and I've always dreamed of starting a school because I wanted to fucking stick it back to them so that we could build a school for people like me. What's interesting is I'm realizing I'm doing it now. I have an enormous amount of 10 to 15 year olds following me across YouTube and Instagram and I'm teaching them, boy. You know, maybe I'm not teaching them the way that people think teaching is done, but I am teaching them and I see it. And, oh, I have a great story. I was flying yesterday from Gothenburg to Stockholm and I sat with a man whose 18 year old son is obsessed with me. He lives in New Jersey of all places, small world. And he said that I made a, so he's telling, I mean, he's, you know, he's telling me everything and I'm very flattered. And he's a young man, this father, he's 44, I'm 42, but he has an 18 year old son. And he says, my son's, you know, I was a good student, the father's saying, my son wasn't as good, but he wants to be an entrepreneur. And every day, he lives at home still, and every day I walk to work, come home, anytime I'm going by him, when he's out and not in his room and working on the kitchen or living room, I hear your voice. And then he turned to me very emotionally and he said, thank you. And you know, it's kind of making me a little bit emotional right now. He said, my son's such a better man now because of you. And, he, and then he started telling me reasons, accountability. You know, I'm teaching real stuff, not memorizing who the fourth president was. And, uh, and then he talked about me talking about my father. And he says that his son's very competitive with him. And I was very competitive with my father. But I, t- I put out some content about how I think about my dad, even though we're different, even though there's a lot I don't agree with. And he said to me that his relationship with his son has fundamentally changed since then. But what do you say, what do you say to these youngsters that make such an impact to those who are listening and maybe haven't heard you yet? I tell them the truth. I tell them the truth. Their parents aren't telling them the truth. Their school isn't telling them the truth. I tell them the truth. I tell them a lot of things they like to hear, like fuck the system, forget about what your parents want for you, this is your life, do not live with regret. And then I tell them other truths they don't like, which is you're fucking entitled, you haven't proven shit, stop being full of shit, like life is long, be kind, nobody gives a shit if you have a Mercedes or a Rolex, shut the fuck up, get to work. I tell them the truth. Okay, I'm I'm, I'm laughing here to (laughs) Thomas as well because we have teenagers and you're right. <laughs> anyway. Um, and you know what, let's, let's hold on to that second, for a second, because it could be very valuable for your listeners. I'm fascinated by what you just did to what I just said and how that plays out in my entire life. When I go to Cannes for the marketing festival and I go on stage and I talk and I talk about stuff nobody agrees with me in the industry, but then at two o'clock in the morning, they'll say to me after a couple of cocktails, you're right. When parents hear my stuff and they're, and they're smart and they're, and they're smart, they don't like a lot of what I say, 
but they'll tell me you're right. You just did it. What I'm trying to figure out is what makes one do something that they know isn't right when they know what's right. What is creating that behavior? What I think is happening is they're worried about what other people think. I have a lot of empathy for a 49 year old woman raising two teenagers in a neighborhood where she has a lot of friends, where she believes in something, but she doesn't do it because she doesn't want the scrutiny from the other moms. I understand. I just don't know why she's choosing herself over her children. I think about that stuff. I don't want my kids to be entrepreneurs. Too many people think of their children as property and as indicators of who they are. And I understand that. I get so proud when my kids do things. I get it. I just don't think it's in the best interest of the kids. And so I'm trying to have conversations that a lot of people aren't. I just said that for the last three minutes because I hope somebody on my vlog or somebody in your podcast, one, if one parent, one, if one parent just got inspired in the last five minutes, those kids' lives are much better for, I mean, you know what, you know how incredible that is? That's what media is. That's the world we live in today. I would have never been known. But the thing you say, get your shit together. Yes. I I recognize that I'm a a daughter of immigrants as well. So we hear that a lot. And Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that immigrants are the best people on earth because we create a lot of good teenagers. But there is something when you have 100%. to, th- you have to thrive, fight for you have it. to fight. My kids can't be as hungry as me. My, I think the challenge that you and I have as you know, kids of immigrants, and I'm an immigrant myself, so I'm real close to it, is I'm ideological about the immigrant framework. I'm with you. Like, even, like we know how lucky we are. Like, because we're hungrier. We, we're, we know what shit, to, you know, it's good. It's better. Entitlement and prosperity has flaws on the back end. But I think the mistake a lot of people make is they try to fabricate the reality of the situation. I see a lot of my rich friends send their kids to Africa for two days and think it's gonna change them. I think what's better is my recommendation for anybody who's listening who thinks that their kids are in a situation that is spoiled or entitled or fruitful, you know, My big thing is I can't fake environment. My kids live on the Upper East Side in Manhattan, go to private schools, have friends who have private planes. I myself, you know, my daughter and son go with me the other day to buy, I went to go buy jeans and buy them some candy. I took 11 selfies, right? I could choose to be rude to people and say I'm with my family, but that's not in me. So I chose to do that, but that's affecting my children. You know, my daughter's like, you're famous, you're a legend. And, And you know, I can't fake their life. But there is something I think that you, where you're going that I think is super important. I do think some things are non-negotiable. So my, ri- my kids are gonna be rich and they're gonna be spoiled. They're not gonna be as hungry as me. When I was 12, I asked my mom to buy Nintendo. She said, go buy it. I figured it out. I could do that to my kids, but it, there's too much surrounding the framework of our family that that's not where I'm gonna go. But where I am gonna go is the following. So for example, something that is very politically incorrect is to hit your children, right? Not a big thing that we do anymore. I'm very comfortable saying on the record, I will hit my child if they ever, ever use my and my wife's wealth to be rude to another child. If my kids ever once in their life make another kid feel bad, because me and Lizzie are rich and they're using that to make somebody else feel bad, I will punch them in the face. I hope they hear that, your kids. You know what's even better? It's better than hearing it. Whether they listen to this podcast or the clip and if they use it, if they ever hear it, it's gonna matter a lot less than the fact that it is our religion inside our home. Sure. They, they've heard it. It's been heard. They don't even know it yet, but it's established. And I think you know, kindness and b- being kind is non-negotiable. I don't need them to be as hungry as I am because they're not going to be. I need them to be kind and I need them to figure out who they are and then I need them to go all in. If they are equally, if they make paintings out of asparagus and make $8 a year, I will be very proud as long as they have as much fire 
in their eye the way I do about my thing. My fire turned into wealth, I get it. But there's a lot of people who have fire who do much greater things than create wealth. I will tell you, I have much more fire to inspire people and make them win than my own. My personal wealth, once I made $100,000 a year, I thought I was rich. That was big. I was pumped. I'm still pumped. 100,000, I can live very, right the now. The best 100,000. Is big. Oh, the best. <laughs> I agree. And, 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 and so I don't like stuff. Like, I don't need money for anything. I don't, I, I, so if my kids become, you know, uh, lecturers, you know, but only make 73,000 a year, they're, they're gonna make me very proud as long as they're fired up and happy. Let's continue to talk about young people, but also business-wise. Okay. Um, there are a lot of examples of brands that are panicking, believing that they are facing their final days. They buy consultants to analyze <laughs> the social media, and they still fail to reach uh, out to millennials, millennials mm-hmm. for example. Um, and I think just... To, to take an example, I think only one of five millennials has tried a Big Mac from McDonald's. Yeah. Like Big Mac yeah. from McDonald's, yeah. Yes. And I mean, it doesn't matter how much social media they try to expose uh, themselves in. It doesn't work. So uh, then McDonald's started to uh, wonder, well, let, let, why, uh, why let, doesn't this work? So why, what do you say? Well, let's start with this. If VaynerMedia did the marketing for McDonald's and they gave me carte blanche, five out of five millennials would try the Big Mac. I'm not joking. I think I can get every fucking person in America, including vegan moms, to eat a fucking Big Mac. I don't think that, you know, I don't think big, uh, McDonald's big problem is the food trends because they sell plenty of salads and they've got all sorts of reasons. I think it's the marketing. I really do. McDonald's spends 80% of its money, 90% of its money on traditional or traditional digital. They're mailing in their modern, contemporary, culturally relevant content in the seven places that millennials play. They're mailing it in. Mm. They spend- But but this is a, a point, yes, but some other economists say that millennials don't buy it. As they don't. Or yes. Yeah. And they start to think like her. Don't trust anyone. Everyone won't. Meanwhile, buy yourself. meanwhile, millennials are wearing Adidas and Vans and Champion hoodies. Millennials buy plenty, and they're buying Smart Water. Like millennials are fucking people. I can trick a millennial to do anything I want. How should I trick them? By making things that are valuable to them. You know how I trick them? By giving them what they want. By not giving them what I want. By being consumer centric by listening to millennials. Millennials will tell you what they want. You're just not listening. You know why? Because older generations have too much audacity. I can get a millennial to do anything I want because I'm deploying humility and I'm listening. That's why. Social media yes. is also borders. Blood in you. Yes. And you live in the US. How? Can you use this fact of two cultures in business-wise? I mean, we are talking you, about you know, if I if I, you know, if I want to be a big personal brand in Moscow, I have more autonomy to do that than I do in New Delhi or in San Paulo. So, one, I think anybody's truth is very important. You know, one of the reasons I think I do very well in urban and hip hop worlds is because I liked it as a kid, because I spent a lot of time with a lot of minorities, because 90% of the kids in my college were a minority. And so I think that what's amazing is if you're willing to embrace your truth, there's enormous amount of strength in that. So for example, there's a lot of people listening right now with diseases that they will never tell anybody. Usually mental, right? I'm very fascinated by what's happening with, you know, meditation, mental illness. You know, if you're bipolar 12 years ago, you're hiding it. I think you need to expose it. And so I think borders are not just, you know, uh, our ancestors and where we're born, but I think it's what, you know, what makes us. I mean, you know, I think that there's so much more that we should be talking about and taking control of it. I, very early on, talked about being a bad student when it wasn't that popular. I cursed on 
content in the early and mid 2000s when that was not popular. Um, But it was my truth. I curse. I'm a bad student. And there's something very powerful about truths. So when I think about crossing borders, if it's your truth, you can be unbelievably successful. Um, I also think of, just this is very tactical, I think it's an incredible time to get bigger in other places if you're willing to transcribe your content. I'm transcribing my content into different languages and watching my popularity grow in Italy and Asia and in Spanish speaking countries, it's very fascinating to see. Facebook is such an incredible tool. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, of, I think of the world as one world. I do think that Soviet, I, excuse me, not Soviet, I think Russia, and I do think China have some different variables because of their structure. China's a big market in itself and it's got its own insular culture. I think Russia it does the same. But other than that, I think of the world as a one. And Facebook helps us with that. 100%. How much time does consumers spend time uh, with uh, Facebook? Do you have a figure on that? No, I don't know what the updated figure is, but here's what I can tell you. Uh, almost 50% of time, over 50% of time spent on a mobile device in the world is being spent on a social network and Facebook has a disproportionate amount of that time. So just ungodly hours and hours. When you take it, I mean, look, in today, as we record this, if you add up the attention, time, that is spent in Facebook and Instagram combined, it's extraordinary the power of that tool. How much power does podcasts have? A lot. Um, I think audio is the next frontier because it's passive consumption and time is very important. So I'm very bullish on podcasts. I'm very bullish on uh, Alexa and Google Home and you know uh, devices that interact with you through voice. Uh, I'm, I'm betting the farm on voice being the next frontier. Wow. Who's inspiring you? <sighs> That's an interesting question. I am... Um, I'm not sure. So let me answer this honestly. That's a good, you know, I'm inspired by everybody and nobody, if you want to be honest, right? I'm, uh, I've never, I've never been framed up as somebody who looked up or admired people. You know, outside of my parents and really even in silos, like my mom is a parenter and as a human being, she gives advice to everybody too just in a much smaller circle than I did. So I grew up watching that, to your earlier question. And my mom's very much my hero. My dad from the work ethic, you know, the hustle thing that I talk about. Um, but it's interesting, I, I'm, my wife for her inability to complain. You know, there's a lot of people, and then, and then, and then you know, just silly stuff. Like, let's use Babin, he's in the room watching Tyler work for me for a year, knowing from day one he came to work for a year, use my name, and then go out and do his own thing. I knew it, I knew it. And to watch him be able to recognize the situation and realize it was valuable for him to stay, I'm inspired by that. Now maybe that's me humble bragging and being, look how good I am, Uh, that's fine. The millions of emails, DMs, and messages I get, I mean listen, I get an email and a DM on Instagram every day that is from somebody that's homeless, 10 times a day, 20 times a day from a single mother in a really shitty situation, 30 times a day, 30 times a day from somebody in a mental negative state. Do you answer all? No, I wish, fuck man. But isn't that frustrating to have so many cries for help? Yeah, no, because I'm practical. I am driven and inspired to be a good man because I think people are counting on me to be. And I like the challenge. I like the pressure. I like, it's what I'm comfortable with. It's who I am, you know? Gary, you should listen to my podcast. Okay, (laughs) I will. (laughs) And I'll listen to yours. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. On this episode, this podcast I did, what was the most interesting insight you hadn't heard before? Uh, in this episode.